So um, let's make a start. So welcome everybody to this um, Future of Performing Arts Education webinar. I'm Robert Wells and I host this webinar along with my colleague Louise Lee. And today we've got three great guests with us who we're going to be discussing interdisciplinarity practice with. Uh, we'd like to make this as interactive as possible. So as we're discussing the topic, feel free to place questions into the discussion box and we'll try to cover those as we're, we're chatting. Um, at APA, we've been um, thinking quite deeply about interdisciplinarity and it's one of the strategic goals that we've been working towards. And this tends to mirror um, trends across higher education where more and more investments been going into developing interdisciplinary courses and programs. And so a little while ago at APA, we had an attempt at explaining different types of disciplinary approaches and we came up with this uh, analogy, which I think Louise is going to pop up on the screen. So we were thinking about how we might think about the differences between intradisciplinary, multi-cross and interdisciplinary. And we used this analogy. So on one side, we've got the carrot, which we thought might be described as sort of intradisciplinary presentation of a single art form or discipline. And then next that we have the salad bar where we've got multidisciplinarity. We see all the different things, all the different ingredients, but they're not really mixed up. They're displayed one after the other, more or less. Then we, we move across a little bit more towards cross-disciplinarity. We're starting to see some interactions. They're a bit more mixed up, but still each retains its own separate characteristics by and large, a bit like a stir fry. They're working together, they're interacting and enhancing each other, but they still consists something of each uh, of, of their original character. And then finally, we have the interdisciplinarity where we start to blend them together. You might still see elements of each of the separate disciplines, but there's a synthesis going on as an infusion and they're starting to become more than any one element alone. We could move forward or move, move even further to the right, potentially with something like transdisciplinarity. The analogy sort of falls apart a little bit, but it, in terms of how we might think about it, it's really about escaping the University of the Academy, a bit like taking your food on a picnic, perhaps. Um, so that's kind of a starting point we might be thinking about in terms of how we describe interdisciplinarity. And hopefully as we go through this session, we'll start to see if this analogy holds up because there are lots of different definitions and nuances around what we think of as interdisciplinarity. So it's possible we might disagree with that altogether by the end of the session. Um, anyway, moving on, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Louise, who's going to introduce each of our speakers. Hi, everyone. Um, and joining us today, we have three speakers. Uh, our first speaker will be Elisa Rossetti, Head of Screen Production and Research Center from the School of Film and Television from um, the Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts. Um, and then we have two external speakers, uh, Dr. James um, Anden, Senior Lecturer in Music, Technology and Innovation from De Montfort uh, University in the UK. And, um, and then we also have um, Hair Post, a teaching specialist uh, from the University of Melbourne in Australia. Um, and in terms of the structure of our webinar, um, our speakers will start with a brief introduction on the topic of interdisciplinarity. Um, and following the discussion, the speakers will take questions from the audience. And once again, please feel free to put your uh, questions in the chart. We'll be monitoring the chat as well. So uh, without further delay, I'm gonna pass the mic to um, Elisa. Oh, that was that was quick. OK. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. And thank you to everybody for joining us. Thank you to our speakers. I can't wait to get into sparring with you guys. Um, for the audience at home, um, we started chatting on email and we've had a bit of um, a contretemps, as we say, we've had a bit of a fisticuffs out already um, talking about uh, what it is uh, interdisciplinary and a lot of really stimulating discussions. So. I mean, I will just kind of briefly introduce myself um, and um, I did throw together a couple of slides, but I wasn't really gonna use them. I, maybe I will, because um, I'm really interested in getting into discussion with Hare and James uh, quickly. So um, I'm head of Screen Production and Research Center at the School of Film and Television at the uh, School of uh, the Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts. Um, what does that mean? That means uh, we run program uh, that is designed to bring different disciplines together uh, for production for screen. 
Um, uh, we are also concerned mostly with teaching our year one intake for the School of Film and Television and giving them a very broad uh, taste of all the different disciplines. I'm going to give it air quotes, guys, so don't, don't kill me. Disciplines um, that we teach them across uh, what we consider to be discipline uh, in film. And um, yeah, my um, slides have something to do with that. Uh, so uh, maybe I will talk just a tiny bit about my background before I start. My first discipline was in dance. Um, I was a professional dancer in my first life. Um, so I danced for Alvin Ailey. Um, Alvin Ailey, um, the Ailey 2 company, um, takes Ailey's seminal work and brings them on the road nationally. So as a dancer, um, I considered my background multidisciplinary because we had to be um, very um, conversant in several different types of, of uh, dance. Uh, we had to be good in ballet. We had to be um, proficient in different contemporary techniques. And we also took African. And the dances that we did um, were very dance theater based. Uh, so I think um, from that, my background is already one of um, crossing disciplines within the body politic that is that is me. Um, from then, we, I went on to doing a lot of musical theater and I sang. Uh, musical theater is also uh, in my in my heart of my my practitioner's heart. I consider it a kind of a well. We'll, we'll talk about the different definitions, but um, multi cross, trans, interdisciplinary. Um, and then I came to film from that background as a performer. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about leading up to this is how did my, how do, how do, how does this space that is me, that is this kind of crossroads for all of these different disciplines, how am I bringing something different to the study of and the teaching of film as, as an art form? And I think, I think I, I think I do because I bring dance the way I was trained as a dancer into film um, pedagogy. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that later. But so I'm just gonna throw a couple of slides out there to kind of stimulate discussion. They're not meant to be teachy or preachy. They're just meant to be kind of, uh, how, how about we look at this kind of thing. So I'll start, I'll start sharing my screen. I'm gonna share. Sorry, give me a sec. There we go. Okay, so you should be seeing my screen, do you? You are? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. So is film an interdisciplinary discipline? Yeah, just, it's just, I'm not, not stepping on toes or making any statements. I'm just kind of like, kind of, let's get into it. Let's, let's get ready to chat. <laughs> so yeah, why The Godfather? Um, because in our discussion, hair, uh, mentioned the godfather of interdisciplinarity. Now, um, full disclosure, I'm not an academic um, and I have not studied these things academically. So that of course made me think about the godfather itself as a film. And if you look at film, for me, this, this artifact that I'm showing you here is, is an artifact that demonstrates um, an interdisciplinary collision, if you will, because you have um, the lighting Obviously, the story that was written and it is now being um, re reimagined for the screen. You have the um, the grammar of the shot that's telling you a story through the framing. Um, you have the mise en scène. You have where people are blocked, yes, and you have the mise en scène of the costumes, um, the colors, the hair and makeup, etc. They're all telling you. They're, they're all in service of coming together to make that bone broth, that soup, that, uh, and, and, and I'm ready to discuss whether this is um, transdisciplinary or not in the definitions that we are uh, about to bat about. From my end, kind of futilely, because I don't really, to be honest, I don't really care. I don't really mind about if it's interdisciplinary, if it's not interdisciplinary and all of this stuff, I, I, for me, they're, they're terms, they give us something to talk about and chew on. But um, if we are looking at our separate disciplines coming together to create something new, then I 
believe film as an artifact demonstrates that. Okay, and, and we can get more into it. This is the scene at the end of the, um, spoiler alert, please close your ears if you haven't seen <laughs> The Godfather. James is laughing, of course you've all seen The Godfather. This is the end, is extremely powerful scene where um, the wife realizes that uh, Michael has now become one of one of the family, the family that they've resisted joining this for the entire uh, film when um, the, the door gets closed literally in her face. So I'm not gonna play you that, but you can refer to the final scene of The Godfather. Um, I wanted to throw some, um, some ideas about what we do in the Screen Production Research Center. Now, I hope that this is uh, not going to give you sound because I kind of want to talk over it. Good. Um, this is an example of something that we were doing um, on the sound stage, the Screen Production and Research Center. This is a um, VR project. Uh, what you see here is a kind of busy set with the, the director who is prepping her actors in this corner and everybody else is kind of working towards what's about to happen. Okay. Um, here you have, uh, again, busy set. The director here is speaking with her producer. Uh, and you have the uh, monitor in, in the foreground. So a lot of tech, a lot of people working towards, again, um, a, a common goal for all of these different disciplines to kind of disappear into what will become the artifact. Um, again, you have, again, the director, she's speaking with crew. I mean, I throw these all up here um, as kind of, can, can you hear me when I'm talking over them? Okay. I throw these up here as a kind of um, a, a window into the soup being boiled, basically, to go back to those analogies, yeah. Um, uh, again, you have a busy set, you have, you've, you've got, the, the tech is being rehearsed. Um, there's different elements that are getting shot together to create the thing. Here's our, here's the technical side. They are creating the, um, on the screen, you can see what they're uh, getting ready. We, we shot um, in depth. This is a depth kit capture that will be put into a, a created 360 degree world um, that we um, will be presenting at the Venice Biennale. So this last one, I really, I mean, I wouldn't show this to anybody else, um, but I'll show it to you guys because for me, it's that chaos of that soup boiling. You can see the dancer in the background, like almost unimportant kind of preparing, but he is actually the focus um, of what is about to go down. So, um, that's basically just kind of what I wanted to show as a kind of, um, you know, an appetizer. Um, so we're Spark, we're a Screen Production and Research Center at the School of Film and Television, Hong Kong Academy of Performing Arts. Um, that's that's all I'm going to do. I'm Fantastic. Sure. Okay, help. There's there's a, a ton of different things to to get into there. So so a couple of things that came came up immediately for me is is whether a single person could be interdisciplinary if they hold different disciplines within themselves so i think there's an interesting question there and then is something like film inherently interdisciplinary or actually is it a discipline in and of itself so there's possibly something else there to be to be mused over at this point i'm going to hand over to james um so james if you'd like to introduce yourself as well Great, thank you very much. So uh, thank you to uh, Robert and uh, Louise for having us and uh, thanks to my fellow panelists. It's very nice to be here with everybody. So yes, my name is uh, James Andine. Uh, I'm at De Montfort University in Leicester. So um, I'm a musician uh, first and foremost. Uh, I have several areas of practice. Uh, I'm a, an electroacoustic composer on the one hand. Um, I'm also uh, an improviser. Improvisation is a big part of my practice and uh, some of my work in improvisation is, is where I've uh, become interested really in interdisciplinary performance. Um, my, my first ventures into things we can call interdisciplinary is I do a certain amount of audiovisual work, uh, usually with, uh, you know, with partners with visual artists. Um, but I think the uh, I ended up uh, be co-founding uh, the research group in interdisciplinary improvisation in Helsinki uh, a number of years ago, and uh, I, I found that a very 
interesting, very stimulating project, ran for a number of years. And uh, that's what caused me to really uh, think about um, interdisciplinarity. We, when we started that project, we were primarily, uh, you know, we were improvisers and we wanted a uh, new context to sort of study aspects of, of improvisation. And uh, we thought improvising with other art forms would be a good way to do that. But um, we found it, one of the things that we found is that, uh, yes, interdisciplinarity was a, a great lens for examining improvisation, uh, but that the reverse was also uh, really dramatically true, that improvisation, our, our one of our conclusions is actually improvisation is a great uh, tool for examining interdisciplinarity. Um, I think because improvisation is, uh, it serves as a crucible for uh, exploring questions like this because it is all about uh, spontaneous utterance. So as soon as you've got multiple people on stage uh, co-creating, communicating in real time, it's, uh, I think, one of the really the best fora for, uh, for revealing process and being able to examine and study process. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that's what sort of led me, uh, led me here, I suppose. Um, so with that project was uh, work, we had uh, performers and artists from a broad range of, of disciplines. We had sound artists, musicians, uh, people from theater. Uh, we had people from studio arts, so drawing and painting, uh, performance artists, dancers, film and video. Uh, so sort of you name it, they were, uh, they were involved there. And... Um, yeah, so we, we covered a lot of, uh, I think, very interesting territory. Of course, we butted up relatively quickly against some of the categories that have already been uh, uh, just mentioned here about uh, transdisciplinary versus multidisciplinary versus interdisciplinary. And uh, we also found, uh, we proposed non-disciplinary in that sometimes there, there are lots of different kinds of relationships and interactions that can happen on stage there, but uh, one of the possible interactions is that everybody seeks common ground. And if everybody is from such a broad range of disciplines, uh, the common ground is, is often just that non-disciplinary without expertise. Uh, expertise expert versus non-expert becomes a very important question. So sometimes there's this non-disciplinary territory that nobody had really planned, nobody had really mapped out, but sometimes uh, that, was, uh, that was a locus. Um, so yes, lots of interesting stuff, uh, lots of interesting questions about vocabulary, um, which again have sort of been uh, bandied about. Vocabulary as barriers uh, to interdisciplinary activity. That starts to uh, come, uh, I think, agree with some of what Elisa uh, was just saying about some of the terminology and things and uh, when it matters and when it doesn't, when it's positive and when it's, uh, when it's negative and, uh, and this kind of thing. So. Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that's what I wanted to say. That's uh, what's brought me here, and I, I look forward to the to the conversation. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, James. Um, and then we we'll go to our third speaker uh, for the introduction. Uh, here. All right, thank you very much, and yeah, wonderful introductions. I uh, um, yeah look forward to hear more about all these things. I think we can just having an interview with uh, Elisa and, and James. We have already have uh, three hours of, uh, uh, of um, uh, fantastic uh, uh, input, I think. My story is actually not that dissimilar from most of you. I'm, uh, in my previous life, I was a journalist. And um, that's when I um, was maybe an interdisciplinary in, in myself. Um, and then I decided I wanted to um, uh, go back to university and then got really um, so I was really surprised that people who would be studying the same subjects would be um, in different buildings usually and and would never talk to each other and so I'd have to cycle from one end of the city to the to the other just to speak to someone who was from another discipline um, um, but who had a different perspective on these things so these practical barriers really um, um, 
yeah, it kind of surprised me. Um, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist from uh, by training. So I started studying psychology and then uh, cognitive neuroscience. Uh, so I come from a natural sciences uh, perspective. So I hope I can contribute something to, um, uh, to the discussion. Uh, the way we um, um, did end interdisciplinarity at the University of Amsterdam um, at the Institute for Interdisciplinary Studies was usually a collaboration between students. So um, we'd have student groups from um, the natural sciences, humanities, uh, work together on a problem usually. And um, in that way, we would encourage them to, um, to integrate their different perspectives, what uh, uh, Louisa showed uh, and, and Robert showed before, um, try to make this soup um, that's nicer than the ingredients um, um, uh, separately, or the sum of the parts would be more than, and then there's just the parts. Um, so that, that's what we tried to do at the University of Amsterdam. We, um, uh, wrote a few uh, handbooks on that to to help our colleagues and ourselves to understand these sort of uh, uh, process that were going on. So they were very much um, um, what, what James and Elisa were describing as well, chaotic sometimes and had no idea what what was going on. It was not really a step-by-step -step process often. And we would actually struggle sometimes to have students engage with the handbooks that we wrote ourselves because they were uh, saying things like, yeah, but we can read this beforehand, but then when we're in it, it kind of doesn't really help us at all. Um, so we've tried different things and, and what usually uh, work better, and I think that's what James was alluding to a little bit as well, is that usually at the, um, after something um, has worked or after a process is finished or students hand in, a, hand in their assignment, that's usually, the time where there's much more room for reflection, but also it, you get a much more deeper understanding of what, what actually happened in, in that whole uh, idea. So maybe when you have to write a, uh, an artist statement, for example, that, that could be a, a time where, you, where actually these um, uh, theories from interdisciplinary research actually can, can help sometimes to, to see what was going on. That's, that's kind of my statement there. <laughs> Um, so I'm a cognitive scientist by uh, uh, training, so at the Institute for Interdisciplinary Studies in Amsterdam, and now I work at the University of Melbourne, uh, where we've started a couple of interesting interdisciplinary subjects there as well. Um, one is Humans 2.0, so where we uh, um, kind of study um, bio bio biomedical advancements, such as uh, gene editing, and study them from all sorts of disciplines. So these are, these are ways, these subjects are ways to bring these people from all these different buildings in the city together to see if we can come to a common language uh, and, and understand each other. That's usually the first uh, uh, thing that we try to do and then see if we can come to, a, uh, to some sort of common ground or, or maybe an integrated uh, perspective on, on these biomedical advancements. Um, and, um, uh, to continue on that uh, uh, collaboration, that's the last thing I'll say, uh, uh, path is I'll, I'll start a, a PhD to explore, explore that further because um, in, in our uh, science disciplines, at least, uh, critical thinking is still um, seen as something that you do by yourself. Um, you write your essay and you hand it in and that's, that's, your, uh, that, that's, that's why you show your critical thinking. But in practice, um, usually, that's not the case. So in practice, you have multidisciplinary teams in a hospital come up with a patient treatment plan, for example, or we, here we have the COVID team with people from all sorts of disciplines needing to come together to come up with one plan. Um, so my um, research project will be uh, studying that, what um, collaborative reasoning is and um, whether it actually helps to put a lot of people together that are really good critical thinkers or whether maybe other skills are much more important to um, um, yeah to put together maybe other soft skills that maybe we'll talk about later as well are, are much more important when you come into these uh, sort of collaborations um, those are i think a few things about me um, i'm happy to uh, great move on <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you, um, all three of you, for your introductions. They're amazing. Um, 
let's get straight into questions and um, let's jump straight in at the deep end, I guess. Uh, something James said about language, and we've got a question here from Zhang Mi, where she was asking, uh, they're asking, what's, what differentiates cross art and interdisciplinary collaboration? And it struck me that very often, particularly in performing arts, we describe um, interdisciplinarity almost interchangeably with collaboration. And are, are the meanings of these words important? Are they something we need to sort of hang on to, or perhaps they, they are more of a hindrance? I don't know. Let kind of open that up for discussion, I guess. I don't know if somebody wants to jump in. Well, I think I, I agree with Elisa again. I think that the ideas are, are obviously very important. Uh, the terminology is, uh, in, is supposed to help us, uh, you know, communicate and, and talk about these ideas. But uh, if we uh, insist too heavily on, on, on them as, as definitions, then I think that can, that can get in the way. Um, yeah, multi multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The, I think what's fundamental is that there are, are different ideas. There are ideas of, of, I mean, the basic one for us, I guess, is people from different discipline in, disciplines working in their individual disciplines, but doing it together versus people from different disciplines sharing their disciplines, everybody operating in potentially in multiple disciplines simultaneously. So that's a fundamentally different idea and that's important. And uh, I think sometimes we get tied up in knots about what we want to call each of those things and end up debating the nomenclature rather than, uh, you know, getting on with the actual subject matter. But I think that distinction, I think it's very important, certainly, regardless of what we call it. I, yeah, I'm not sure. Is it important? Okay. So, um, yeah, I can see how the theories help. I can see how theoretically it helps to be able to have the discussion, but my concern is, and I think maybe James, you, you might have a kind of a resonance with this as, as a musician who can step, step into the space and you can improvise. Um, if, if before you step into that space to improvise, there's a kind of um, um, a straight jacket put around it that you are gonna be doing a this or that project. Well, I, yes, it, maybe it's important to say, no, we're all gonna work on our own disciplines or no, we're not gonna all work in our own disciplines. But I, 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 I'm a little concerned that, um, that these, words um, are, are used to kind of, uh, I'll, I'll say, appropriate uh, process and to appropriate the artist and to appropriate creativity to become the, the you know, the, the underling of the academic structure. And I, and I, and I, 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 I'm concerned about that because from, from my perspective um, and through my looking glass, the best interdisciplinary projects and the, the, the most meaningful exchanges come about quite organically. You, it's very difficult to dictate to a bunch of people. If you, if, you, if you want artists to not work together, you tell them to work together and they're not gonna really work together. They'll just pay you lip service. But if you kind of get out of everyone's way about talking about if it's interdisciplinary or not and just let it happen, things will happen. Like I'm sure, I mean, I'm not sure, but I'm assuming James that you kind of got to where you are from studying a discipline and that you became so well, so proficient in that you were able to then improvise in it. And then you branched out to wanting to work with other people. And then that kind of organically evolved. Do you, it, I, I mean, that's how I see it from my perspective. Yeah. No, I think, yes, I agree a hundred percent. I think that's right. I think that you've raised, uh, a different but very important issue uh, around, uh, that comes back to what Hare was saying. Um, uh, there's a very important difference when we're talking about these things, uh, about uh, when, when the sort of reflection takes place. And uh, does that, do we have this discussion in the planning stage? Okay, we're going to go do something, so let's you know, map out the territory, or as you say, do we do something organically 
And then once that's happened, then sit down and reflect and say, okay, uh, what's just happened? So yes, uh, especially as an improviser, but but more generally, I agree with you entirely, Elisa. And also as a composer, when I teach composition students, when we're doing analysis, I, I, I'm very clear that, um, you know, universities have a lot of focus on, on critical reflection and on analysis. And when you, you teach something creative, you know, I try to make clear that actually if, if creative work is going well, it's, it's much better to keep that door shut entirely, <laughs> just cauterize that part of your brain off while you're being creative. And then I, I find it more effective to open that up afterwards. Okay. What just happened? What did we do? How did it, how did it come about? So uh, yeah, that's right. That's another one of the dangers of terminologies and, and, and uh, being obsessed about that area of things is it can be a real hindrance to uh, organic creation. And um, to throw in something else, what, what I kind of got in the question as well, from a natural sciences point of view, um, what, what we would say is that um, collaboration, yes, is definitely one thing, but there should definitely, but there should be no um, perceived um, inequality between, between the different disciplines, for example. Um, a psychologist using a statistical method, we would say is not doing interdisciplinary research, he's just using another discipline for um, um, as a means for, for, for its own discipline and so for psychology. So would, um, is that something um, that could, um, that you can relate to? Is that, I mean, I'm coming I mean, from like a that. complete layman's perspective, right? If, well, if a director is completely dominating the set and is uh, 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 saying the lights have to go like this, the, 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 the script writers need to change that, is that, would you? So that I mean, that's a brilliant uh, way to look at it, and this perceived inequality is 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 also quite interesting, especially in regards to filmmaking, because um, there are different ways of working in in the film within the within the hierarchy of film. So it can be very hierarchical. Once you hit set, I think there's a reason for the hierarchy and the militariness of it. Um, it's just keep you, there's so much going on. You need someone in charge. But uh, I, I believe and I teach that a, a good director is basically a captain of a ship that, I mean, it, it has to all get set up before you start, you, you know, they're not making the ship while they're going. It's the ship has, they've all agreed on this, the ship is going to work. The ship is sailing in this direction. And that direction, um, you know, if, if you have a strong creative team, then that creative team will at the planning and designing stage be contributing in such a way that it, the the discipline should fall away. The DP shouldn't be like, you should be seeing my beautiful lighting. The DP should be like, my lighting is in service of this other thing, the story that we're gonna birth. That's that soup that we've agreed that we're gonna make. It's something that's something different that we've agreed. I think the discipline should become um, um, invisible to the thing that you're birthing, right? So, um, but I do think that there are a lot of filmmakers out there who are just bullies and it's like my way or the highway. Um, but that doesn't mean that what the result that you see doesn't maybe also end up being a, a beautiful, you know, dissolving of all the disciplines into the one thing. So I think that, I don't know, I, I don't know what, what James thinks about this as, as also an artist creator. Um, but yeah, we could really, really talk about it. My, but my, my issue is more in the, um, in the academic context where mm -hmm. education wise, there are these structures and then there's, um, there are the powers that be that decide that we are going to be interdisciplinary and therefore it looks like this and these many people need to work together and it needs to be, and then you have to check those boxes and then you have to have come up with this many and uh, interdisciplinary where actually you I, I find that if 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 the if the environment is right what what will inevitably happen is people will get to the end of the year and they'll go back and they'll go oh yeah i can put that in as an interdisciplinary work but they didn't yeah. go into they didn't plan to go in it's it's actually kind of back to what james was saying is like you do it and then you look behind you and you go oh what did we just do and i think if, if institutions and, 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 and academies and academic world wants to kind of um, have more of this, um, yeah. 
then they need to get out of the way of it and stop yeah. you know, defining it and appropriating it and talking about it in these webinars. <laughs> Lisa, Lisa, I think, I think, yeah, like I agree with you that like filmmaking is, is um, you know, is this, 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 this place where kind of different disciplines come together, but I kind of, I, I want to kind of stick closer to the academic def definition, you know, so is it just collaboration? So for example, if I'm a sound designer, other people are just doing their thing. So I, I, I don't know the lighting, it looks nice, I don't really care. I'm not, I'm not you know, so her earlier mentioned about collaborative, collaborative critical thinking or you know, critical thinking collaborative or people thinking from like kind of different frameworks, you know, and, 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 and somehow to bring kind of different perspectives together. Um, sometimes I think of like business ethics, you know, when I studied business, you know, before, like before business ethics, you know, I only care about making money. And then when I study ethics, you know, all of a sudden I, oh, you know, human matters. And then when the, you know, two disciplines kind of sort of merge together, then, okay, actually, you know, when I care about human beings, I can also make money. Like, it's kind of like that kind of synthesis, right? So I'm just thinking, um, you know, in filmmaking, is that happening? Are the students that you show, for example, are they... Um, is it the product is interdisciplinary, but how about the process? Do they assess one another? Do they have that criteria to assess one another? Yeah, that's, that's, those are really good points. So a couple of things there. So because, and this goes back to one of the questions that I think we have that came in from the audience um, in this interdisciplinary push, is single discipline study important? And so I think um, in this case, there. In, in terms of teaching, there is always this kind of push pull. It's a kind of, I think it's, Hare was talking about tension. There's always a kind of a push pull of, you kind of have to get up to speed enough in the one thing to, to get it under your belt enough to then be able to take on board the next thing enough to see where those definitions are and then break them down. And I'm not sure if I'm answering you directly, but um, I'll take, I'll go back to the Godfather. Um, so if if that when if famously when the uh, the cinematographer was lighting the Godfather and those scenes were being viewed, the dailies were being viewed by the producers. They almost pulled the plug. I can't remember exactly what the story is. If someone out there is a cinephile and please don't kill me, but um, the story goes that it was so dark that they couldn't see it and they wanted the cinematographer to make it brighter and you know and it, it, the, the the team refused the cinematographer refused and we have now this beautiful piece of cinematography in film and why because that was the character the character was in this dark place and they didn't want to reveal uh, too much detail on the face they wanted that feeling um, so there was a cinematographer who was not actually doing their job technically um, but in the service of this thing that they were doing together, folded his his discipline into the service of the story. So the service of the the soup. I'll just keep saying the soup. <laughs> so uh, how do we teach it? That's a problem because you um, you have to get to a place of of knowing enough to um, to be able to handle enough of what you do to to let it go that's that's so so i mean james is probably i keep going back to you james i'm sorry but you've probably you know you probably people think improvisation and and we had this in dance you know you think improvisation you just get up and kind of do whatever oh you're 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 busting it out on the spot but actually obviously no you've obviously studied ten thousand hours to get to the spot where you can spontaneously produce and and so i mean i think Sometimes what happens is we assume that people can get into a room and fold in and lose this and, and the perceived inequality thing that Hera was talking about. So you you kind of, you you assume in, in uh, and oftentimes I see in institutions, they say, oh, we're gonna do interdisciplinary in year one. It's always year one. <laughs> it's like, it's like, no, we, we need to get, up to speed to then be able to know that this is my lighting that I then release and surrender to so that it became become part of a of another thing. Did, did I answer your question, Louise? I don't know if I answered it. I think I think dance is another uh, really good example, especially with with students. If you um, 
you know, we put, uh, you know, dance students and, and music students together in a room and uh, to have them work together. And uh, it's, it's guaranteed every time that the, the dancers uh, think that the musicians are there to provide accompaniment. We're going to dance, we're going to tell you what we need, and you're going to provide it. Uh, to a lesser extent, the musicians sometimes think we're going to make some uh, music and you're going to be our our dancers, you know, like, in, I don't know, a music video kind of sense. And obviously neither one of those is satisfactory in any way. And uh, it, it's surprisingly difficult to get them past that, to, to, even, to get the dancers to comprehend that, no, the musicians are not here to accompany you and that you're not here, and nor are you here to both just go do your thing and then bring it together, that you need to come up with something uh, together something, uh, in this case, I guess, multidisciplinary. Uh, yeah, that's surprisingly uh, uh, difficult. So, I think, um, so James, James, can I just grab you for a second? So um, so I grew up in the Alvin Ailey studio where, I mean, I was so blessed. Our musicians were such an integral part of what we did. So yes, they were accompanists, but we had... Um, people, you know, banging on the piano, hitting the floor, using their voice. Um, and there, from the very beginning, there was a, there was a, a kind of a fostered um, idea that when you were moving, you were, you were feeding, there was a definite feeding off each other. There, I mean, it was, uh, you, maybe you were working with more classically trained people. I don't know, but in, in the way I grew up, the musicians who played for class were so into playing that sometimes on their break, they would join each other and they would come in and they'd be riffing, especially in certain classes where, you know, that, that atmosphere was fostered and, you know, we were giving and they were giving. So sometimes we had three people, you know, we had in, in, a, in one class just because they wanted to be there. So I think if, you, if, if a dancer has grown up that way, you might get more of it. But yeah, I, but I know what you mean, yeah. I wonder if I can just jump in with, with another question, just to look at this from a slightly different perspective, and it might be a, a moment to bring hair. Um, so far, we've discussed a lot about interdisciplinarity in terms of art forms working with each other, and actually they're quite close to each other. However, increasingly, the arts are looking at other areas to be, to be working with, whether that's taking it into art forms, into healthcare settings, or perhaps it's working with technologists and starting to think about what it might look like to place your artwork online or in a completely different context. So I'm just wondering about how, how we might approach interdisciplinarity from that way. And I guess, I guess in the sciences, sciences work with engineering or different things. Actually, there's, there's potentially more experience there in terms of how we manage such very different disciplines coming together. Is that for me? Yeah, be great. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, um, uh, the, the, the story that comes to mind immediately is um, um, an artist working in a hospital in the Netherlands. Um, and um, I think he had a, uh, the idea to paint one part of the, the hospital, um, um, I think orange, or at least the ceiling was orange. And that turned out to be the, uh, the part where, uh, of the hospital where people with burns, uh, skin burns would come in. So they would come in and they would lie on the stretcher and uh, uh, would see the orange um, um, would see the orange ceiling and were immediately uh, drawn back to uh, the fire that they just uh, got out of. So that was one way of um, 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 maybe an example of, of where these sort of collaborations do not work at all. But it also, um, um, yeah, it, it, it's from a psychological perspective point of view it, it, it's um, not adding anything and you can also probably um, approach that from a from an arts point of view can you actually use the context in a way that it, it's it's actually adding to the art or it's actually a, a, an, a, an addition um, uh, to this so I think there's there there is a lot of um, um, work uh, um, uh, to be done there, um, but I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, it 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 it, I'll, it will probably start with with uh, a conversation about the aim. What the aim of uh, what's the goal of of having um, um, art in in a in a situation like that or in a context like that? Um, do do we want to have? Um, um, yeah, is is the the idea to to make people. 
uh, healthy, to give them an, an, an experience, to, to um, um, something like that. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but um, that was the first thing that came to mind. I think there's a, uh, it, it draws to mind, uh, Robert's question draws to mind some examples that I think demonstrate Robert's right. Uh, you know, I, I was talking about, if we talk about the gulf between musicians and dancers, Robert's absolutely right. That's actually about as close as, as things get. Uh, and as you go further, you know, a field further apart, uh, the risk, some of the risks we've talked about get exponentially greater. Uh, so I can think of examples, for example, where uh, research projects that brought together a musician and a neuroscientist uh, to, to examine something. And I can think of, uh, of a couple, or a zoologist and a, and a musician, there's another one, where it's a lovely idea, but uh, the, each, each one potentially has significant preconceptions and possibly in, just incorrect preconceptions about uh, what's happening on the other side, which essentially, neg I think, in the examples I'm thinking of, negates the results. Where, for example, the neuroscientist, uh, you know, has an idea about what music is that isn't nearly broad enough, maps, uh, you know, uh, signals in the brain to, to music in a way that because there's something false right at the core, right at the start of it, the, the findings, I think, end up being false. But maybe that's a, a partnership that's not uh, functioning properly, because in theory, maybe the musician should be the one who's who's solving that. But I do think, uh, Robert's right, that the risks expand uh, quite a lot, uh, the further the further apart you get. I wonder yeah. if there's something here here about the, the context of what interdisciplinarity is for. So I know quite often it's talked about as a solutions based approach. So we have a problem, we think we can't fix it with a single discipline. So two or more disciplines work together to solve that problem. And that's quite a different space to let's put a neuroscientist or somebody in a room with a musician and see what happens. If we just randomly place those people together, there isn't necessarily a problem or an issue for us to be solving. And, and is, the, is the inclusion of, a, of an issue important in interdisciplinarity, particularly if we're doing that kind of project, do we think? As a neuroscientist, I'm afraid, I'm a bit more skeptical about the neuroscientist actually not trying to solve problems because he or she is probably thinking about grants and is trained in such a way that um, um, they immediately start to uh, think, how can we produce knowledge uh, with this collaboration? So I think um, um, it, it is, yeah, when you, I think we, uh, in interdisciplinary literature call it broad interdisciplinarity, it becomes immediately a conversation. It should become a conversation about assumptions and what, what, how do you see a human? Do you see a human as someone lying in a brain scanner uh, listening to snippets of music or is it someone sitting in a theater uh, um, uh, experiencing music? Th these are fundamental uh, assumptions underlying uh, research methods, methods for neuroscientists and uh, uh, probably underlying your um, ideas of, of, of how people experience um, um, how people experience music and when you start to integrate you you should immediately um, um, talk about these things otherwise you'll have a very superficial um, um, interdisciplinary project that you can read about on any web page uh, anywhere in the world really um, so it, if if it's done properly you really come to the most interesting and fruitful conversations, I think, about what what it is, what how, what what are we going to do? Um, yeah, and I think um, that's maybe um, where um, there are some tools. Like, what kind of questions can you ask each other? What, how can you refrain from coming with uh, solutions to a problem? How can you explore the the the, the space that we're in together? Um, that. I think there might be some tools there from, from interdisciplinary uh, research that people have thought, talk, thought about how to, um, how to have these conversations. But I'm, I'm really curious to hear what, what uh, Elisa, James and Louisa think about this. Um, so, I mean, I, I really think it's important to when I, I I think it's I, I hear what James is saying that the the and and Robert is saying that as you get farther away, that that 
there's a kind of an exponential possibility of, shall we call it misunderstanding for the sake of our argument? Um, but I then kind of come back around to um, what Jer is saying about, of Her, sorry, is saying about, um, well, that can be kind of built in, in, in any due diligence or, you know, a, a process of working together that you come to know a bit more about each other instead of this, you know, you're, you're doing my gig, you know, you're in service to, to me. Um, you dancers are the background for my music video or, or you musicians are, you know, keeping the beat for my dance, you know. So, yeah, I think discussions like this are, are essential to to say to to realizing that oh yeah oh, oh, we're going to come in to this thing with with preconceived notions and so therefore yeah hang on that's true we do need to stop and take this much time you know before we start working um inverted commas working so i do think that it's important to have this kind of um, discussion. I also think that it's okay to get, you know, people from completely different worlds and have them not be able to kind of come together or not be able to do anything or not, you know, the solution or not solution. I think these are all valid. So saying we need a solution for a problem is valid and saying we're not really going to look at problem at all. We're just going to come together and see if we can have a conversation or learn more about each other is is valid. I just think that it. I'm back around to the appropriation idea that if we start to define it too much, that it becomes appropriated and then used instead of um, uh, instead of it being you know a wonderful um, mm -hmm. uh, in, in organic uh, a way of working with each other. And yeah, yeah, that's why. That's why. Uh, James, what do you what do you think? Yeah, I agree with uh, with Elisa. I mean, on that last point, yes, I think that uh, setting goals uh, and and putting together interdisciplinary teams to solve them is uh, uh, is a perfectly reasonable approach. But I think sometimes maybe it uh, misses uh, some of the sort of finest potential fruits. In that, I think one of the the glorious things about uh, interdisciplinary uh, projects is putting people together and they they find territories that, that we didn't even know was there you know you can't set a goal in a in a territory that you don't know is out there and putting people together in a multidisciplinary team uh helps to map that stuff something else that elisa said that i think is correct matches kind of nicely to what uh kathleen bell has asked in the chat uh so elisa was saying that uh yes we it, that we need to take some time uh to to uh explicitly uh, uh, work out this territory where everybody's uh, going to be comfortable working towards a shared goal. And in the chat, uh, this, uh, Kathleen has said, I think there needs to be a lot of humility and healthy confidence to work in this way. How can we help to create a safe space where everyone feels that their ingredient is important, but the soup is ultimately the most important? Which I think is a really, really good question. And I think I, I don't really have it, I mean, it's, in some ways, the most important question. The uh, answer, I think, is basically what Elisa said. It's time, uh, but that's, un I mean, it's unbelievably important, but it's extremely delicate, extremely subtle, and extremely fragile. So it does take a lot of time to create that safe space and for people to feel confident. And there's no getting away from the time it takes. I think it takes a lot of time for that to happen. Uh, and from my perspective, as a performer, uh, and what I think is an interesting angle on that is you spend all this time creating a safe space where everybody's comfortable and you get to somewhere uh, really productive, but then you have to take that in front of an audience or you have to take that on stage, which in, in some ways is really not a safe space in, in some kind of ways. And how do you take this very fragile practice that requires this kind of security and then put it in front of a potentially hostile uh, audience, you know, they're not necessarily thrilled with what you're doing. And uh, that is, uh, yeah, that is complex. But I... <laughs> so I, I, just, I agree. Oh, sorry, Luis. Sorry. 
Now, so, I want to bring in one more question from, uh, from that was sent to us um, earlier uh, from uh, Pamela Howard. Um, so this goes back to the education context. And so, so Pamela said, I'm usually the initiator of in this interdisciplinary creations, yet there is still negativity. Is this common? Um, is this common in your, in your discipline? Um, for me, uh, y yes, or not, not so much negativity, but it's uh, probably what relates to what uh, Lisa and James were saying before. You would try to create a safe space, but at the same time, we're in education, so we need to assess people on something. So we need to come up with a with with something that we um, um, that, that, that 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 says you've passed the course or you haven't passed the course. So that's that's the tension uh, there that. Um, at least in, in, in the natural sciences, that's, that's a big problem because not, uh, interdisciplinarity isn't uh, regarded as, um, it, it's becoming a buzzword, but it's not regarded as highly as disciplinary research, uh, citations, uh, um, grants. Uh, uh, so all these sort of things, and students know that, of course. So they're, they're um, uh, drawn to interdisciplinary courses, but they also know that if they want to score high um, uh, on their exams, they should or or um, have a, a um, bigger chance for a job. They better uh, stick within their discipline and become really good at um, a method, for example, that will get them a PhD or um, something along those lines. I think that connects with what Elisa uh, was saying before about institutions too. Unfortunately, academic institutions aren't uh, uh, designed with interdisciplinary work in mind. So there are all sorts of structural issues, uh, very banal and practical. So if you get a grant, you know, whose docket does that uh, go to? Who gets the credit? Who gets the credit for the publication? And uh, individuals are very territorial, research groups are very territorial. And while everybody, well, in fact, everybody's actually very eager to, to, to collaborate, uh, but the structures make it make it very, very complex because the fruits, uh, people don't view the fruits as getting properly divided. So it becomes very, very sticky. Yeah, I'd have to say that's the, the main thing in the way of, um, yeah, that folding into each other, because even if you, even if you believe in the product, you know, then you, and, or the process, if you believe in, let's just say no product, but you believe in the process and then, you know, and the outcome of the process is then, you know, trundled off like a, a war bride, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so uh, there's definitely the territorial nature of the disciplines within a school structure uh, definitely make that problematic. Um, I kind of want to also quickly go back to this idea of safe space and and um i i agree with it and I, I i preach it and i try to create it but we have to admit that there are beautiful works of art that are created that were not created in safe space you know so that it doesn't it doesn't have to be a safe space to i i uh, we, we fight for it and make sure that it's happening, especially in the educational world, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily what always happens in uh, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary work. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. I, as soon as you start to go out of your discipline, like we're doing now, it starts to become scary or, or, or you feel this tension. So um, um, we, we have uh, quite a few discussions about like the way the subjects are um, um, evaluated here is that usually students' perceptions are really important. Like if students like the course, that means that it's a good course. That's pretty much um, 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 the underlying uh, um, a perception sometimes, uh, especially for, for a lot of educators. So there is quite a bit to say that some Sometimes you have to get out of your comfort zone to to do your best work. I yeah I, I I completely agree, and that may not feel great or comfortable at the same time. Maybe not even when you do the student evaluation, but maybe later down the track, um, it may provide something. Yeah. I'm 
it's been a really fascinating conversation. I feel like we could roll on for ages, but unfortunately we're more or less out of time. Actually, I think we're over time as it is. So we're going to need to wrap this up a little bit. So I have, have a final question for the three of you, which is if there's one thing that's either struck you or that you'd like people to take away from our discussion, what would that be? I, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to say <laughs> it's like, I, I don't, I don't know. I have to think, I have to, I have to think about, I, I, I think time, time, and I need time to think about the answer. I don't like to, to, to kind of spout it out when I'm not sure. I think it's okay to take time. Yeah. There. Perfect. I can say what I will take away from it. Um, uh, and I really like the idea of uh, improvisation as a tool for examining interdisciplinarity. I really, uh, yeah, thought that was a uh, something I'd never thought about uh, uh, before, and it sparks all sorts of ideas. So um, I'll um, think about that and might reach out to James later to uh, hear more about that. Um, uh, yeah, interesting, very interesting idea, I think. That's very kind. Thank you very much, Herr. Um, I think, yes, I think on the on the broad scale, what I think uh, it would be nice people take away is that uh, there that there's a lot of uh, of juice here. There's a lot of juicy stuff. It's a, it's a, it's a rich territory. There's lots to talk about, lots to think about, lots of perspectives. Um, if we wanted something more a, a practical uh, a single takeaway, uh, I think what we were talking about a, a few minutes ago about the the risks of uh of setting a task before the process has started uh rather than uh, following the process to see where it where it might lead that's not entirely i think actually that's a broader question about academia and research generally that's beyond uh multidisciplinary work is is that uh, some of the best results come from having the opportunity to follow a process where it leads rather than setting a goal finding you know uh, setting the path to that goal and then and then following it through i think that's i think that was a, that's an important point i think just just the but those three points is, uh, to highlight how rich the conversation is and to be honest i think we could do this again probably two or three times over and and, and still only just scratch the surface so um yeah it's been amazing fantastic thank you um for everybody who's stuck around as an audience that's Really nice. Thank you for watching the webinar. Um, and I'd like to obviously say a huge thank you to Hare, to James and to Lisa for taking part. Um, and also a big thank you to the wider Eduit team who've worked on the technical and administrative aspects of this and putting the webinar together for us. So thank you everyone for your involvement. And just want to say that the, re the recordings for this webinar and also the past webinars, um, they are on our website. And I just shared the link on the chat box. Um, and our next webinar is going to be on student-centered learning. And it's going to be on Friday, December 10th. Um, so, and that's it for today. Goodbye for now. And stay safe. Stay well. See you next month. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, all.